This morning, we celebrate the resurrection. He is risen. He's risen indeed, yes. And we are grateful because we get to do this every Sunday. So in many ways, Easter is not anything different. It's not anything unique from every other Sunday because every Sunday we declare the resurrection. Every Sunday we proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And so in so many ways, this is no different. But it is good that God has given us this rhythm every year to just pause and to really consider the reality of the resurrection. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, he records this, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they, when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Would you pray with me? Father, our entire hope And faith rests on this account. We know that you lived. We know that you were crucified. and We know the tomb was empty. And everything that we believe and hope for is found in the resurrection. So God, I pray that we would consider this reality. Lord, And would you hold a mirror up to us and let us see our heart and in our lives. Do we really believe this? Have we wrestled with this? Have we considered what this means if you rose from the dead? Help us to hear from you today, Lord. Protect our church family, Lord. Don't let them hear my voice, the things that I have to say, but Lord, would you speak to them? Would you speak to all of us that we may know you and love you and follow you? In Jesus' name, amen. So this passage is familiar with many of us. If you grew up in the church or even now if you're on social media at all, you're going to see this passage um, plastered everywhere. The idea that that when the angels say to the disciples, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And that statement means so much for us today. In fact, it's everything, everything in our entire faith and our entire world hinges on that. And not just Our faith, but the history of the world hinges on if Jesus rose from the grave, if he walked out of the tomb. Recently, there was a a famous actor who is not a Christian. He was on a panel and they were just doing this interview. I think it was um, promoting a new film. And they just asked, hey, if you could, it's a lighthearted question. If you could go back in time and meet with any historical figure, who would you meet with? And without hesitation, he said, Jesus. And because it was kind of a lighthearted interview, everybody laughed because they thought he was just making a joke or just saying like, you know, what would maybe be a a Sunday school answer or something. And he he didn't understand why they were laughing. He said, I don't know why you're laughing. Like, that's who I would want to talk to. And, and And he said, who else would you rather meet with? Who else would you want to ask questions of? And everybody, like on the panel, all of a sudden got really serious. And they thought like, oh. Because we understand, even if you're not a Christian, you understand that so much hinges. Like everything hinges. If Jesus walks out of that tomb, then everything he said is true. Everything he claimed about himself is true. And if he didn't walk out of that tomb, then we are above all to be most pitied. Because As Paul says, we are still dead in our sins. The question of did Jesus actually raise from the tomb is 
The resurrection of Jesus often is the way that people will frame the accusation against Christianity and and religion in general, but specifically when it comes to the resurrection, obviously with Christianity, that it's just, it's a fairy tale, that it's unreasonable. We talk about things like blind faith, that that reasonable people, evolved people, like people who think scientifically and logically could not believe that a man was actually murdered and then walked out of his own grave. And so lack of faith and belief in the claims of Jesus is often pinned on being reasonable, logical. But Blaise Pascal, who is the 17th century philosopher who devoted his life to reason and the power of reason, said that's actually not the problem at all. He said the problem isn't that the resurrection is unreasonable, that people find it unreasonable. The problem is that people are afraid that it could be true. So the problem isn't reason. He said it's fear. He said this, men despise religion. They hate it and are afraid it may be true. The cure for this is first to show that religion is not contrary to reason, but worthy of reverence and respect. Next, make it attractive Make good men wish it were true, and then show that it is. See, the, the issue that he was dealing with is, he said that they, the problem is not that um, reasonable, rational people look at religious people and people who believe like, in, in the resurrection as they are irrational and they are clouded by you know, fear or, or hope or just like wanting to be captured by a fairy tale. That's not the problem. He says it's actually reversed. The problem is that people who are so against the claims of Christ hate it because they're afraid it's true. You think about it, that's why it brings up so many emotions and why it becomes such a a hot button issue because we have emotional attachment to it. Think about it, we believe all kinds of things. You believe things and I believe things about how the world works that we each would think that the other one is foolish for. But it doesn't really bother us. Right? Like, you could believe, like, there are people in this room right now who believe that the Packers will win another Super Bowl sometime in their lifetime. (laughs) Foolish. Does not affect me in the slightest. Like, doesn't bother me at all. If you tell me, like, Jordan Love is the next Brett Favre, I'm like, okay, buddy. you just like, great. Does not bother me. But why is it, the reason why people get so wrapped up in the question of like, did Jesus actually raise from the dead? And are we supposed to commit our lives to following him? And what does this actually mean? The reason why it it brings so many emotions up in the world is because the question of what if it's true? Because if it's true, that means significant things for my life. It means that there's something outside of myself, someone outside of myself, somebody that I have to answer to, somebody that I am accountable to, somebody that holds truth. Like, I am not the master of my own domain. I'm not the holder of my own truth. See, it's not our reason that keeps us from God. It is our irrational desire to hold on to an illusion that we are God's. We often will say, and people will say, well, no, it's, it's reason, like logic. No, it's actually our irrational desire to hold on to the illusion that we are gods that keep us from God. That we are actually in control. That we can understand everything. That we can make sense of everything. That if everybody just did what we think is the right thing to do, then things would be fine. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because you're either going to raise your hand or you're going to be a liar. But if you think about this, when was the last time like at work or when you think about politics or anything that you've watched that you say, so obvious. Why don't you just do this? And to you, it makes total sense, perfect sense. That is all declaration that we believe that we are the holder of truth, that we are the master of our own domains, that we can control our environment. And it's actually quite comical because we know at our core that that's not actually true. The idea that any human being could have control or could stave off death or to think that we understand the world, it's, it's delusional. 
And it is this delusion that keeps us from really surrendering our lives to Christ. And it's terrifying to us that the idea that the world that we have made for ourselves, the the worldview that we have, the kingdoms that we have cultivated for ourselves, we know that they're fragile, but that's what we have. And if this isn't real, if something else is real outside of it, then it's terrifying. We're afraid of what we might find. That the world exists beyond me, that truth exists outside of me, that meaning is found beyond me, and I'm accountable to someone outside of myself. And it's so much bigger than me. So what then? Do we want to continue to live in the illusion that we are the kings of our own kingdoms? Or do we want to know the true king? To paraphrase Pascal, Tim Keller said that the cure to this was to first show that it could be true, then make people want it to be true, and then show them that it is true. So I'm going to briefly try to do that. And I say briefly, you guys are in luck because it's crowded in here, there are kids in here, and nobody right now is hotter than I am. And so it will be much briefer than the sunrise service where we had lots of space and we all felt good and energetic. One of the questions I get a lot when I talk to people who are skeptical about Christianity is you can't, they'll say, how do you prove? Can you prove that God exists? I, that's an easy one because I can say, no, I can't. And you can't prove that God doesn't exist. So now we started at that base level. That's not possible. You can't prove that God exists and you can't prove that God doesn't exist. And so that's not the attempt of this, but to actually open up the idea of, hey, this is a reasonable, um, this is a reasonable conclusion. This is a reasonable possibility. It's clear, like we have different theories. If you think about how the world began, nobody knows No one knows. No one was there. No one observed it. The irony that any scientific method would lead to any conclusion about how the world began is kind of laughable because scientific method, by definition, is what you can observe. And nobody observed the beginning of the world. We don't know. One apologist says it this way. He said, only shallow truths can be proven absolutely. The deepest answers of life are beyond absolute proof. I can prove to you that I'm married. I have a document that says it. It has my signature on it. It has my wife's signature on it. I can prove that we're married. I I can't prove to you that my wife wants to be married to me. And the second thing is much more important than the first. So just because we can't prove something absolutely doesn't mean that it's not critically important. In fact, the deepest truths, the most important truths, are the things that we can't actually know 100%. What we do know, what we observe, as Romans 1 tells us, that we can observe what can be known about God is, is plain to man. We can look around and see in creation things that we know. If we, if we just kind of look at it without any bias, we would know that nothing comes from nothing. Right? We would know that structure doesn't flow out of chaos. We would know that our world is, is observable and, and understandable and predictable when it comes to nature. Like we can, we can predict how animals are going to respond to things and how plants will grow. And it's interesting that the only reason that we know that is the birth of the scientific era came out of Christianity. Because it was Christians who said, hey, God created all this, so there must be a purpose to it. And there must be order to it. And so we should observe it. A lot of people don't realize that. You think that like science, science grew apart from Christianity. It didn't. It came out of Christianity. Other people believe that the world was chaotic. And if you believe the world was chaotic and there was no meaning and no purpose, well, then why study how a tree grows? Because the way that that tree grows is going to be different than how this tree grows. There's no rhyme or reason to anything. It doesn't matter. So don't observe it. Don't study it. It was Christians who said, ah, God created that tree. Why did God create that tree? What's the point of that tree? How does that tree grow? What does that say about who God is? 
And it was because we believed that that we studied it. And then there were things that we couldn't observe and couldn't prove, like the love of a parent for a child. Like, how do you, how do you prove that? Where does our sense of morality come from? Where does our appreciation for art and for beauty come from? Or our desire for justice? These are all things that are not easily explainable if we were just matter that just collided together and just kind of happened. And again, it doesn't prove anything. But Pascal would say that only a person blinded by fear that it might be true would say it's unreasonable. And then you ask about, well, okay, if God does exist and we are here for a purpose, how do we know that Jesus is the representation of that? With all these other religions, like how do we know that Jesus, like did Jesus actually exist? This is the easiest one because simply put, in the interest of time, virtually everyone in human history since Jesus has believed that Jesus lived, that Jesus was crucified and that the tomb was empty. Virtually every other religion in the world believes these things about Jesus. Every historical document we have from that time confirms these things about Jesus. It's, it's actually, there's far more evidence that Jesus lived and was crucified and that the tomb was empty than evidence we have for any other human that lived 2,000 years ago. And so when you put these things together and you say, okay, how did we get here? And then, what is it with this Jesus? No wonder that actor said, that's who I want to talk to. Because he claimed to be God. And he claimed to raise from the dead. I don't want to go back and talk to some philosopher who tells me how he thinks the world might work or a philosophy of, a, of how like, we could have a better life or how you might have more peace on earth and all these other things that we might have. Like, I want to talk to the one who reportedly gave sight to the blind was crucified, and then walked out of the grave and said he was God. That's who I want to talk to. And it's a reasonable question to ask. Was he actually who he said he was? Was he crazy? Was he a liar? Did people make up things about him that he didn't know they were making up about him? These are all legitimate questions. But a reasonable person has to say it's possible. And if it's possible, and if it's true, then it is amazing. It's called good news for a reason. Luc Ferry, who's a French philosopher, says this about the Christian story. He says, it's not easy to resist, but it is too good to be true. I just find that so fascinating. A person who's an atheist says about the Christian story, like, that is, that is a difficult story to resist. But ultimately, it's just too good to be true. The author, Julian Barnes, says the reason Christianity is so powerful is because it's so beautiful. He calls it the beautiful lie. So here's what's interesting about that to me. When you read critiques about Christianity from people who've really studied it and like concluded against it, like said they're an atheist, the reason over and over and over that they give for not being able to believe in Christianity is not because they struggle to believe um, that, that God could have created something. It's not because they struggle with heaven and hell or anything like that. It's because they hear the gospel story and they say, that is too beautiful and too good to be true. That says something about it. And I just want to say that just because something is beautiful doesn't mean it's not true. These are things that should make sense to us. If somebody says to me, well, as, I, as many times people have said to me, um, well, you just, you believe this because it brings comfort to you. Yes, it, br- it brings comfort to me. That's not the reason I believe it, but it definitely brings comfort to me. It definitely brings purpose and meaning and hope in my life, for sure. And just because it does, doesn't mean it's not true. I would argue it is too good. It's too good for us to imagine. But it is true. And so what is it that they see that they say is too good to be true? I think it's this. I think it's freedom. 
We are constantly chasing life found through freedom. It's what we want more than anything else, to be, to be free. And we find different ways of doing that. Like what we have is our own kingdoms and we try to figure out ways that we can be free. And because through freedom, we feel like we have life. And every person has an idea of what that looks like. For years, the boomers and the, and the Gen Xers, we believed in this, some version of an American dream. And that version, that dream has ruled the lives of so many people. The idea of owning a home and having a retirement account and being able to retire in comfort was the dream that people pursued for so long. And they sometimes killed themselves in pursuit of that dream working long hours, sacrificing everything that was important to them in the moment for that dream. The dream of buying a house that takes you 30 years to pay off only to realize you still pay taxes on it. The idea of putting all this into a retirement account only to see the stock market crash. The idea to try to retire in comfort and travel the world only to be faced with cancer. And you realize that there's no freedom in that dream, that that dream actually enslaved you your entire life. That's why it was called the rat race. And then the millennials came along. Do you remember the millennials? They were a thing. They still are. They're here. They're among us. They're here. <laughs> They're still here. They've just kind of been forgotten about a little bit. Like Gen X got forgotten for a long time. Now Gen X is having like a revival of like, hey, remember those guys? Millennials are now like the forgotten people. But they were there. And they looked at their parents and grandparents and said, no, 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 that's not the dream. Like freedom is not financial freedom and having like security and all that. No, no, no. The dream is to be free of any expectations or responsibilities. So we started having a culture that started hopping from job to job and kind of like, you know, taking time off and early retirement and people starting to have plans of like, no, no, no we're going to spread this out. And rather than acquiring possessions, we want to acquire experiences Getting free of the rat race, free of commitments, free of those responsibilities. And what they're finding is a life that is free of commitment, free of responsibility, is a life that is free of meaning. As they travel around and acquire all these experiences only to realize that nobody would notice if they were gone. Their only relationships being very distant because they don't want to commit to anything. And so then we have the younger generation comes up and says, ah, that's not freedom. That's not the dream. And they see all of that happen around them. They see it falling apart all around them. And so they just withdraw into their devices, into a world that they can control. And I can just focus here. And I don't need to pay attention to anything that's out here. I can just have this here. And it becomes the dream of living for being constantly compared to others. To being constantly dependent on people's instant and immediate feedback. And living and dying with all that. So they, they didn't want detachment. They wanted attachment, but finding it in a way that is destructive and painful. And what you noticed is each generation says about the previous one, you didn't get it. You chased a false dream, a false kingdom, a false idea. We've got it now. Only to realize that they're chasing sand also. See, it's nothing new. Every generation, Satan dangles an imaginary utopia in front of you and tells you that if you just follow your heart and follow and figure out your truth, you can get all of these things. You can get your kingdom. And it is all a lie. And that lie has enslaved us. And we can't help ourselves. We're slaves to, to pursuing that illusion. If you don't believe me, if you put your hope in finances and in security, then try just giving away a lot of your money. If you're, if you're a, like a millennial who like ended up in a situation where you're just like wanting to be free of all these responsibilities and everything, just try committing fully to something and buying in. 
It's terrifying. And the reason it's terrifying is because, well, what if, what if I lose my kingdom and then I have nothing? You ever think about when the disciples follow Jesus, they set everything down and they follow him. Do you ever think it like occurred to them to think, oh, wait a second, what if this guy's a lunatic? I totally just gave up my entire fishing business. Like, what's going to happen? And you know what? People did do that over and over again, which is why Jesus said things like, if you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. There's an all-in nature to the call of Jesus. But the opposite is to say, no, 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 I can't handle any of that. I'm just going to go with the world and the kingdom that I can control. And we are enslaved to it. We are slaves to our imaginary kingdoms. And then our kingdoms become at war with other kingdoms. And so the way I think the world should be isn't the way you think the world should be. And the way you think the world should be actually keeps me from having the world that I think it should be, which is why I think you're the worst. And we do that to each other over and over again. And we find representations in politics and other things and factions where we say, no, no, if we can get our kingdom then everything will be fine. It's those people out there that are making it difficult. But what the gospel says is the problem isn't out there, it's in here. The issue is my rebellion and your rebellion against the true king. It's not that my kingdom's good and yours is bad. It's that both of our kingdoms are illegitimate and illusions and rebellions against the true kingdom and the true king. And the good news, and the reason why philosophers look at the gospel and say, this is impossibly good news, is because what does the God of the universe do with all these rebel kingdoms and all these rebel, like, all these rebel kings that create all this war and faction? He saves them. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. See, what we find is that despite all the efforts of what Satan and the world would have you believe, you are not the key to unlocking abundant life. You are actually the lock. Jesus is the key. He is the gate. And he is the way. And he offers abundant life and unending joy for all eternity. He sets us free from that slavery, free from that sin that entangles us. Think about what right now is an obstacle to, for you. What do you have from your past that you say, I wish I could be free of that. I wish I had never done that. I wish that I, that I could make that thing right. Like Jesus sets you free from that. He makes it right. He forgives you and sets you free. What things do you feel like you're constantly getting in your own way, constantly making things more difficult for yourself, constantly tripping up and falling into the same trap over and over and over again. Jesus sets you free from that, free from the temptations that have lured you in the past, free from like pursuing so many of these other things. I don't know about you, but on the surface, I can be prone to think like the problem is everybody else. Like, um, like I know I live in Northeast Wisconsin, so like this isn't gonna be a shock to anybody, but sometimes don't you feel like if everybody just left you alone, you'd be fine, right? Some of you are not paying attention because I know, like you, you, already you've been left alone. Like you're just in your own thought, your own thought, your own, your own world right now. And then that is what we think sometimes and we think that, but the reality is when I think about it deep down and I consider what I want my life to look like and what it has been and the obstacles that have been there, I don't know about you, but I tend to find I'm actually the problem. Like, there's so many days where I'm like, if I could just get out of my own way for just a minute, if I could just, like, get myself to do the thing that I know I value and I know is important, if I could just stop reacting in this way, stop buying into this lie, stop doing this other thing, like, I... I just can't even get out of my own way. And the gospel says, Jesus is going to set you free from yourself. I'm going to set you free by forgiving your sin and forgiving your rebellion and and getting rid of your kingdom. And in kindness and gentleness, he destroys our kingdoms and gives us his. Because that's what's incredible about this, is that he doesn't just forgive us for our rebellion. He makes rebels his sons and daughters. This is why philosophers say this is nuts. 
It's one thing that a king might forgive the rebels against his kingdom, but to make them sons and daughters. And then he goes farther and he takes people who are thieves of his glory, who steal his glory and try to steal um, the kingdom back. And he makes us heirs to everything. Like who takes somebody who tries to steal from you and then says, oh, you don't need to steal anything. Here, everything I have is yours. That is what makes it a fairy tale to many people, not the resurrection. And the way that we lay hold of this freedom is what Jesus said to his disciples. It's not by working ourselves out of slavery. It's not by proving our worth. It's by saying, as he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? This is the good news of the gospel is that if you want to keep living for your own kingdom, then you will lose it and everything else. But if you lay that down, and pursue Christ and his kingdom, then you gain everything. That's what the world finds too good to be true. That is the claim. And that is what is true if Jesus walked out of that tomb. And he did not walk out of that tomb so that we could go on living our own life and our own kingdom and just kind of saying like, okay, Jesus, I'll just, really glad you resurrected from the dead. When I need some help in living out my own life and my own kingdom, I'll let you know. He's saying, get rid of all that. It's an illusion. It's a lie. It only leads to destruction. That's why he says the thief comes to kill and destroy. Even if he offers you things, even if he gives you false hope, it's not real. His aim is to destroy you. He said, I came so that you might have life and have it to the full. So deny yourself. What would it gain? Like, what does it gain to like gain the whole world? What good is that? To only see it fall apart in the end. When you deny yourself and come to him, you realize that your kingdom it is fragile and an illusion is replaced by his kingdom that is real and lasting. Is real. If it were not true, he would not have said it. Your desires that are always fleeting and can never be fulfilled and everything that you chase, you think that's going to do it and it doesn't do it. Those desires are replaced by his desires which are true and beautiful and fulfilling and lead to contentment. What would you give to be content? What would you give to be at peace? What would you give to feel fulfilled? What would you give to have temporary happiness replaced by unending, abiding joy? What would you give to be free from worry, knowing that your Father in heaven knows everything that you need and provides for you? What would you give to be free from what other people think of you and what other people's expectations are of you and feeling like you have to constantly win a comparison? What would you give to be free of that? Knowing that you are loved by the creator of the universe and every moment that you live is, has eternal significance in just trusting him and living by faith. What would you give to have no fear of death because it's already been defeated? No wonder that same French philosopher said amongst the available doctrines of salvation, in other words, amongst all the world's religions, nothing can compete with Christianity, provided, that is, 
that you are a believer. And he says this, were it to be true, I would certainly be a taker. They know what we should all know, which is this is impossibly good news. And it all hinges on if he walked out of that tomb. And I'm not going to take the time to go through the evidence, but it's, it's real. Remember that pretty much everyone agrees that he lived and that he was crucified and that he was buried in a tomb and then the tomb was reported empty. There were thoughts that the disciples had um, stolen his body, which could make sense to protect the lie that, they've, you know, that they had perpetuated. But then when you consider their fate, it makes less sense as they all died horrible, horrible deaths. And it's, we, we understand, like, it makes sense. People perpetuate lies to save face or to gain power. But nobody dies for a lie that they know to be a lie. There's a thought that the Romans may have taken the body. But that doesn't make sense because as the church was growing in power and influence and kind of turning, they literally were charged with turning the world upside down. The Romans definitely would have presented the body and said, hey, just so you know, he didn't actually raise from the dead. This is what they were preaching all the time. Jesus Christ raised from the dead. And they would have said, no, he didn't. But they didn't because they didn't have his body. There's the theory that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. That's a lot of other religions explain it that way. They say, yes, Jesus was crucified. Yes, he came out of the grave, but it's because he he never actually died. So the theory there is that after being beaten to within an inch of his life, having flesh ripped off of his body, having nails driven through both his wrists and his ankles, severing the nerves in his legs and his arms, being pierced in the side, suffocating in his own sweat and blood, and being placed in a sealed tomb that Jesus slept it off. I mean, think about it. He awakes three days later, stretches, tosses a big boulder out of the way, and hops out and says, hey, I'm back. No worse for wear. Grab some breakfast. I mean, frankly, of all the theories, that's the one that I look at, like, if he did do that, that's pretty impressive, though, right? I mean, the most obvious explanation is that he actually rose from the dead. And the reason why we struggle to believe it is not because it's too, that's too fantastical. It's because what does it mean if he really did? What does it mean for us? And so I just want to encourage you to consider that. And the most obvious evidence that he really did raise from the dead is not those other theories. It's simply this. What happened to people who believed it? The witness of the early church was amazing. They turned the world upside down. I mean, really, what odds would you give a guy, a poor man with a Messiah complex who's only won over 12 common men and some marginalized women to start a movement that would spread across the globe and change the world 2,000 years later? What are the odds of that? How could they explain? Even then, the early church could not be explained. They could not understand how to deal with them. Because they were just so subversive. They just loved each other. And they were, they were immune to the things of the world. They were immune to the threats of the world. They couldn't, they couldn't arrest them. They couldn't scare them. They couldn't kill them. They couldn't do anything to them. They just kept growing. And they kept growing in this community that looked like something they had never seen before. They took care of the widows and the orphans. They had the rich and the poor together, Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, in a world that only knew how to divide people by power and systems. They pulled together. They became family when they had nothing in common. They sold everything they had to make sure that everybody around them was taken care of. And it made the world take notice. And oh yeah, earthquakes broke them out of jail and things like that. It was amazing. But the thing is, that didn't just happen 2,000 years ago. It happens today. The evidence is all around us. That yes, while impossibly good, it is not impossibly untrue. If you look around you, there are people around you who have been radically transformed in the same way. People who have been healed of illnesses. People who are facing cancer right now with incredible courage for the hope that is before them. 
people who are struggling with incredible grief and sorrow, but who find a deep abiding sense of joy and peace, knowing that even though they are scared, their father isn't and they trust him. People who have given their lives to serve and to go into cultures that they didn't know to go and share the gospel. People who have given everything. And listen, I understand that in the American church, sometimes it's hard to find those people. We just have to call that out. If you've ever been in a country or an area where you've gotten to worship with persecuted Christians, you know it's just different. It's different. When we were spending time with an underground church, you look around and you think, nobody's here because it's convenient. Everybody that's here is all in with Jesus. And there were times when I was overseas that I thought, oh, how can I go back? Like, I just want to be here. I want to be with people who are just all in for Jesus. And then I came back here and realized those people are here too. There are people all around you right now. And I'm looking and seeing the stories of transformation and radical faith. And they're all around you. Evidences that Jesus did raise from the dead, that he really did come to set us free, that he really has given us life and life to the full. I encourage you to find those people. Don't settle for talking to people who just talk about religion and going to church and, and doing some good things in politics. Don't settle for that. Find people who say, I met Jesus and he completely radically changed my life. Find those people and watch them. Follow them. I promise you they won't be perfect. But I promise you that they will display the fruit of the Spirit and demonstrate something that just seems different to you. And let that be evidence. And to say, is it possible? What if he did? Is it too good to be true? Or is it incredibly good that it is true. My story is that Jesus completely changed my life. I've given my whole life for the sake of the gospel, and I will tell you in all my years of following Jesus, I've also fought my own kingdom. My identity as a church planter, my identity as a pastor, my identity of expectations placed on me in the church, and I will tell you that nothing has given me more freedom to say, I don't want any of that anymore. I just want Jesus. And that's why every week we just proclaim Jesus over and over and over again. You will not find what you are looking for listening to me. You will not find what you are looking for just attending a church. You will only find what you are looking for in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we hope by the grace of God to help you in that. We are just beggars together finding him and following him. And that's why we come together around the table. And that's why we're doing it in response today. And so as we take communion together today, I just want you to consider this. Did Jesus raise from the dead? Do you believe that? If you do, let me just tell you that it is the most important thing you could ever discover or ever figure out in your life and ever see and just cling to him. You don't have to have everything answered. You don't have to have it all figured out. But just say, okay, if you raise from the dead, I want you. I want to cling to you. And as we come together, that's what we are declaring when we take communion together. It's why Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And he says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What he's saying is that when we gather around the table to take communion together, by participating in it, you are proclaiming to your brothers and sisters around that table that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again. And we are proclaiming it until he comes again. And so if you are at that place, like maybe this is the time, 
If you are not a member of this church and this, you're visiting here with us, you are welcome at the table. The only requirement for coming to the table is that you say, I want to cling to Jesus. You don't have to have had a great week. You don't have to have been like, man, I've been knocking it out of the park. When Paul talks about taking communion in an unworthy manner, what he means is taking it for any other reason other than I'm clinging to Jesus. If you take it as a religious show or take it as like just something that you hope, like, well, what could, what could be the harm or some kind of superstitious thing, that's an unworthy manner. But taking it as a person in need of grace who says, I don't really know what's going on. I just need to cling to Jesus. That is the worthiest of manners. So I want to encourage you to do that. And so if you are here, maybe this is the first time you made that decision. Maybe you're saying, I do want to follow Jesus. I've never done that. I don't know anything about Christianity. I don't understand any of this stuff. But what I hear, I believe, and I believe he rose from the grave, and I want to be, I want to, I want to turn over my kingdom and repent of that and come to him, then come to the table and take communion. But if you're here and you're still seeking and you're wondering and you don't know, I am so glad you are here. And I would just encourage you to stay and consider why did God bring you here this morning? And ask him, God, are you there? Jesus, were you, are you who you say you were? Did you raise from the dead? And don't be afraid of what you'll find. Because if you find that, you will find life everlasting to the full. Let's pray. Father, we pray as we come into this time of communion. Lord, I know Lord, I know that the only reason we can do this is because of who you are. That you are who you say you are. So Lord, I pray during this time that we would we would embrace the beauty of the resurrection and that we would see, God, what you have done for us, that you demonstrated your love for us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the power that rose Jesus from the grave is now the power that dwells in us who have trusted in you so that we live our life not in our own power, in our own strength, chasing our own kingdom, but in your power, in your strength, in your righteousness, for your kingdom. And it is good. So Lord, I pray that as we come together, Lord, I pray for those as they gather around the table that they would see around them brothers and sisters, even if they don't know, and that they actually would encourage one another by just looks and participating in communion of saying, we are proclaiming the life and the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus until you come again. And Lord, I pray you would not Allow us to waste the time while we stand and wait that we be considering all of these things before us. What part of our lives or our own kingdoms have we not surrendered to you? Give us eyes to see people around us that need encouragement, that need to know and be reminded that you are who you say you are. And because you are who, we, who you say you are, we have hope and joy and peace that surpasses understanding. So Lord, please be with us as we gather around this table, as we remember what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.